Hey everyone, I hope you guys are having a great day. Welcome back to another video of this series where I'm basically showing you how I'm building a Minecraft hosting service. So if watching this series is something you might find interesting, be sure to press the subscribe button because I'm gonna be publishing more videos of this series just showing you how I'm building this along the way and building in public. So a couple announcements are, the first one is I made the repository public, so you're welcome to go and look at the code. There's a lot of things that I wanna go and clean up and I'm not too sure if I even wanna use TypeScript or not. So I may refactor it all to just use JavaScript. That's a whole nother discussion I might make a video about, but yeah, I have some, some cleanup I wanna do, but if you're interested in contributing, feel free to go to the issues tab. I have a couple of issues lined out that people can try to fix. Um, and then make a pull request to my main branch with your changes. I can either approve them or disapprove them or give you some feedback. And if I like your changes, I'll go ahead and merge it in. Um, also, don't do any work on this project unless you get my approval. I don't want you to invest a bunch of time trying to change something which I don't want changed. So make sure you open up an issue and get an actual like okay symbol from me so that you can actually work on it and actually get that code merged into the branch. So that's the main announcement. I didn't really do too many code changes since the last video I posted yesterday. I did some refactoring and I added some documentation. So I figured, hey, let's just go ahead and give you a walkthrough of the readme slash documentation I added and kind of sh shared the direction I'm going with what we got. All right, so in terms of the project, I did add some more to the readme, kind of explaining what the project is. Hopefully you've been following the series, you know what this project is for, but you can go ahead and just check this out. This is the link here. I don't know if I'm actually gonna call this, like if I make a company, if I'm gonna call it Firestone Hosting, this is just a, a placeholder company name. I'll probably change that in the future, but I got a, a link to the my YouTube channel and also link to this series so that anyone who goes to the code can actually go and start watching this series and see how this project has involved, evolved over time, I guess. I have a getting starting section. So this basically tells you that the project is broken into three main components. You got client, API, and you got agent. So you have to actually run all those separately. So like you have to have three terminals, CD into each of those folders, do an NPM install, and do an NPM start to have the service running locally. I kind of looked into using Lerna for doing a mono repo, but this is kind of how I've been used to doing it, just so that it's very easy to take your project and just move it out of your repository into a new one if you would like to do that. Um, but I may bring in a Lerna just so I can kind of learn more about it and experiment with doing a mono repo approach versus this approach. Um, but yeah, that's just the way it's set up now. Um, let's see. So in order to run this project, so I'm actually going to move my head over here because it turns out that a lot of web pages kind of align to the left and my head's blocking a lot of stuff. So I'm going to try to keep my head over to the right for now on. But anyway, um, in order to run the agent, so the agent's the thing that actually controls spinning up and tearing down these Docker containers, which are hosting Minecraft. So in order to run the agent, you need to have Docker installed. So you can go and install Docker desktop if you want. Um, I believe it's free. They do have like a license that they've changed, but if you're doing something that's open source and not making money, you can use Docker desktop for free. And then there's also a dependency I'm using called SoCat. So SoCat is a library that you can use to basically like send commands to other processes. I'm not, I don't really know too well what it does. I didn't really look into it. All I know is that I'm using it to be able to send commands to the Minecraft server. Because remember in the last video I talked about, I kind of broke that functionality because of the way I've changed how I'm handling these Docker containers. I needed to find a new approach to actually be able to send commands to the standard in of these Docker containers. So SoCat happened to be one solution that I found. But the last section is flows. So I plan to create a lot of diagrams to explain how this architecture is set up, right? So this might get a little bit um, complex over time. So I wanted to kind of describe how it works currently using draw IO and I want to kind of list out the user flow. So the one, the main user flow that you might need to be interested in is how do you actually have a user come in and rent a server? So the high level view of that is a user goes to the UI, they click the rent a server button or buy button, whatever it is, that hits an endpoint called new user purchase, right? So this payload is gonna have the username, the password, their address, and the server instance configuration. So like how much gigs of memory does it need? And that hits the API. And what happens is the API is going to store a record in database. Right now I'm using SQLite, but I may refactor this to just use Postgres. 
I'm not using an ORM. I'm actually just writing SQL queries because I think that is a, a better approach to building performant um, database queries. But I may bring in an ORM um, like Prisma. I think it's called Prismic or Prisma just to make it a little bit easier. But I do create a database record that says like, hey, um, there's a server created by user A and I need to put that server somewhere, right? So also in the database, there's another table that called nodes and those have all of the different agents, right? So you might have a bunch of different machines with different IPs that are running agents. The database needs to keep track of what agents are running and also how many servers are running on that uh, agent. And the reason we do that is because the API needs to know what agent has the most amount of free memory that I could maybe put this Minecraft server on. So you could, I haven't really implemented this, but I could either do like some type of round robin approach or just do the first node that comes back and just keep filling up nodes until you run out of memory. In terms of scalability, it might be better just to try to fill up one node at a time because hosting or because renting one of these bigger servers with like four cores of memory and 16 gigabytes of RAM costs about like 50 or 60 bucks a month, right? You only wanna have like one at a time, right? And when that one's about to get filled up, you go ahead and rent another one, set up the agent on it, um, and then you can start putting Minecraft servers on that one. So the idea is all about like scalability. How do you scale this without spending a bunch of money renting these larger servers just so you can host a couple of Minecraft servers? Because what I don't wanna do is have like five of these servers um, charge me money and then I only have one client using Minecraft, right? So I want to kind of scale that and buy these servers on a need to need basis. Uh, anyway, that was a tangential topic. So the last step is we actually, the API via a WebSocket is going to connect to the agent's API. Remember, there's an API running on the agent. And it basically sends a request saying, hey, I need you to start server XYZ with one gigabyte of memory. And then that's going to basically kick off a docker command to run that service as a docker daemon run okay so that'll like build the container with whatever version of minecraft that you want and then it's going to basically run that docker server all right so that was like a high level view of how a user can rent a new brand new server brand new user to the system renting a brand new server i may come back and add more detail to this if this needs more detail but I plan to just keep on adding kind of diagrams to kind of explain the different flows because I think that really helps people understand how stuff is working versus you come into a project, there's no diagrams, there's no documentation, and then you kind of have to dive through the code to understand like how these things connect to each other. So that's the readme. Um, just keep, a, keep an eye on this because I'll probably update it over time if you're interested in following along. But the second thing I want to talk about is I did make this project open source. So you can go to this URL, you can look at the code, you can contribute, like I said. Um, but there are some issues that I added. Um, now, I didn't add these with the thought of other people grabbing these and doing them. But yeah, I mean, you're always welcome to kind of just read the title and do it because if you look at most of them, there's no descriptions. So you kind of have to understand what I'm trying to say when I say fix the various ESLint warnings. That means that you need to take the initiative to run all the projects and look through to see if there's any ESLint warnings. And I think the client is the only one that has it. So I just put a client tag here. But a lot of these, you have to just have some intuition and take some initiative to figure out what I'm trying to say, because I don't want to spend a bunch of time like adding descriptions and stuff when I know what it does. But most of these should be pretty, pretty straightforward. Like this is documentation, create some high level flow charts of how a user rents a server. I actually just did that one and showed it to you all. So let's just go ahead and close it. But you are more than welcome to kind of grab one of these issues make a pull request and make sure that you put the issue number. So like pound 24, if you decide to work on this one or something, but uh, you don't necessarily have to work on these. You can actually add new issues if you have an idea or a feature you think you might want to add. And if you do that, um, I'll go through it and I will review it and see if it's good. If I like the idea, I will go ahead and put some tags on it and keep it around. If I don't, I'll probably just close it. So just keep that in mind. So those are really like the changes in terms of the project. I did make some code changes I did want to kind of talk about. Um, the main thing that I changed is if you remember in the last video, I talked about how I can't send commands to the Minecraft server, right? So if you were to go to the UI and click on terminal, right? So that loads up all the logs that are running on the server and I can actually send commands. So before this wasn't working, I think this should work now. So if I do slash help, it actually crashes. So this is an issue I'm running into on my laptop. For some reason, when the agent is running on my MacBook, 
SoCat keeps on failing. Actually, I think it's because I uninstalled it. I might need to reinstall it. <laughs> All right, that's done installing. Let's just go ahead and start my agent on this laptop and hopefully it works. No guarantees because sometimes Mac stuff just doesn't work as well as actually running on Linux. The machine I have downstairs is a Debian installation. So it's really easy to just install these like packages and just have it work. But uh, yeah, let's just try it again. So I'm gonna reconnect to that server. Make sure my WebSocket is not throwing any type of exceptions here. I'll click terminal. We should get back some logs. We should be good. Let's try typing help. And if that works, we should see back a bunch of things. If not, we probably crashed our endpoint. Let's see. Yeah, so this is the issue I'm seeing when I run this. It's saying like it can't find, what is it actually saying? Bad file descriptor. So I really don't know why this happens when I try to do this on Mac. When I do it on my Debian desktop, it works fine. Okay, that took a while for my agent to load up. This is, I'm running too many things on this machine, so it's like dying. Let's try it one last time. I don't think it's gonna work, but it's worth trying. So type slash help, backend is still throwing that same exception. Um, yeah, so I don't really know. So just keep that in mind that if you can figure out a solution to this, I would, I would much appreciate it. I can't figure out why this doesn't work on my laptop, but it works fine on my my Debian installation downstairs. So I don't want to spend too much time onto it because I, I know this works when I have when I'm not running Mac. But yeah, that's the main thing that I kind of fixed. It took me a, lo a long time to figure out how to get that working. And then other than that, I did some code refactoring. Let me stop all these node instances because it's really eating out my CPU. And I'm going to go ahead and kill that running Minecraft server just to kind of gain back some CPU. So some other changes I made is that inside the components folder, actually, let me talk about the client folder because I made some changes in the client. I have a components folder, which is supposed to be where all the shared components are. And I used to have a bunch of like uh, TSX files, like React components, which are actually like top level pages. So I went ahead and just pulled those components out and put them in a pages folder. So anytime you go to a route, I have an app router here. That app router is loading in one of these files that have page in the suffix. This is my way of like knowing which is a page and which is a shared component. But I moved some of these components to pages because they were pages. And inside the dashboard, there are like sub components that are only scoped to the dashboard view. So these don't have page suffixes, but they're more like outlets. So maybe I'll add an outlet or something. I don't know. Well, that's the main change I made for the front end. I upgraded all the package dependencies. So I went through and just made sure I'm on the latest version of a majority of all the package um, dependencies. It's always good to make sure you're, you like constantly update your package JSON uh, dependencies because you don't want stuff to become out of date because that can introduce security flaws and issues. So I went through and updated all those. There's like one um, thing on the API or the back end that I can't update for some reason because it messes up with TypeScript. But yeah, I just kind of want to show you that. The last thing I want to talk about is my use of TypeScript. So I am a beginner when it comes to TypeScript. I don't really use TypeScript professionally. So I thought it'd be a good experience to kind of try to build out a project using TypeScript all across the board. But what I'm starting to find out is that I end up wrestling more with TypeScript, like adding types to functions, adding types to the data objects, than I do with actually building out the implementation. And I'm starting to, to think that I don't even want to use TypeScript on this project because it's slowing me down. I know a lot of companies say TypeScript is awesome, but but from what I noticed, every time I ever use TypeScript, my productivity just decreases because I end up spending all this time wrestling with the TypeScript compiler, wrestling with these TypeScript errors that show up. Sometimes there's errors that show up in my console when I'm trying to host the service, but they don't show up in my actual code. So there's just a bunch of stuff with TypeScript where I'm like, dude, is this even worth it? Because honestly, most functions that you have, like let's just look at a random function. I have a create node interactor. If you look at this, what amount of code was added just because of TypeScript, right? To add types to this, I had to add this and I had to add this. Um, and then I had to attach this here to kind of define this as an interface. So I added all this extra code just so someone who's calling this function knows that this takes a node argument and an application context argument. 
right? But it turns out that once you've actually become familiar with the project, you already know what node is. That's probably just like a record in the database for my nodes, right? So I don't really need TypeScript to kind of describe what this is doing. And then also like you have to describe what it's returning, a promise, a void. I already know it's a promise. It has async here, right? So a lot of TypeScript in my opinion is just like frivolous. And I don't really know if you really need it. I know that's like hearsay for some TypeScript lovers, but it's honestly, I just like find myself wasting a bunch of time and adding in a bunch of hacks to get TypeScript to work. Like for example, if you look here, I had to add this exclamation mark because there isn't chance, there's a chance that find returns undefined. But me as a developer, I don't care if it's undefined. I'll just let this throw an exception if this is undefined, if I was using JavaScript. TypeScript is gonna complain and say, hey, like you need to make sure that this is actually checked. Like you need to make sure memory is actually checked. Or sorry, you need to make sure that the thing that's returned from the dot find method actually exists before you start using it. Um, I mean, maybe that's a good thing to do, but honestly, I just don't like adding these little hacks everywhere. This, and this more happens in my React code. Like you'll see it all over my React code where I'm trying to grab something from an array or grab something from somewhere. And it's like, oh, this may be undefined. This may be null. So then I'm like, no, I know for a fact it's going to be defined. So let's just add this exclamation mark. And there's just other silly little hacks that you kind of end up doing with TypeScript, which I just don't like. But that's just my opinion. There are some benefits to TypeScript. I'm not trying to completely write it off. There are benefits, especially if you have a large team of people and it's really hard to like keep track of all this code. But overall, it's just like, I don't like it. I'll be honest with you, I just don't like it. So I might actually go back through and just remove all this TypeScript stuff and just use JavaScript because that's what I enjoy coding with. And the second thing I wanna talk about with TypeScript is like, in order to run TypeScript, you have to have like a TypeScript runner. So I'm using TS node to kind of interpret this TypeScript and run it. And it turns out that it takes a while to actually run through your TypeScript files and just host your, your API. So my agent, when I try to start it, it actually takes a couple of seconds to start, which is kind of strange because if you're using Node, if you're using just JavaScript, it starts like that. It's like instantly up. It doesn't have to do any type of uh, compiling steps or whatever to kind of build out TypeScript or build out your project in TypeScript. It just works. So there's like a bunch of overhead in terms of the performance, in my opinion, that adding TypeScript just isn't uh, isn't cutting it for me. So if you are using this project and then in a week you find out that everything with TypeScript has been removed, don't be shocked because I'm just not enjoying using it. So, but yeah, I mean, that's all the changes I really made for this project. I just did some refactoring, added some documentation, made this public. If you enjoyed watching this video, give me a thumbs up. Also, be sure to comment below if you have an idea or suggestion of where I should take this project. And then like always, if you're new to my channel, be sure to click that subscribe button and also that bell icon because I'm gonna be publishing more videos like this in the future to kind of document my journey of building out this Minecraft server hosting system. All right, have a good day and happy coding.